Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hello, everyone. I'm Ross Morasso. Welcome back to the show. My guest today, one Lloyd Alton, historian for New York City and the Bronx in particular. Been a teacher, historian, author, with a few books at least, The Beautiful Bronx, The Bronx in the Innocent Years, Bronx, Bronx Accent, and as of recently, presented the 2022 Man of the Year Award by Meet the Elite. Lloyd Alton, welcome to the show. Oh, glad to be here. So the Bronx, I remember the first time I walked around that I was just a pup in the 1990s trying to find my way over to Rayo's <clears throat> restaurant when I was first working for the Martha Stewart Living Show back then. And I got lost and I just started walking around and I actually found it to be a pretty wild place. What are some of the most interesting places and features of the Bronx, do you think? Uh, I think the entire Bronx is fascinating. Uh, each area of the Bronx has its own charms and its own attractions. Uh, the Bronx as a whole, uh, most people don't know that it's uh, geographically about the same size as the city of Paris. So uh, if you're going to see the Bronx, you know, uh, don't think that's going to be just a, a few hours. It's going to be, a, you know, quite a long time. And maybe if you want to get into it, you know, maybe a couple of days. What, what do you find that uh, people that are learning about, about the Bronx are most, most surprised to learn? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, what they're most surprised to learn is that it's not a pile of rubble. Uh, mm. that, uh, mo uh, m many people think from the uh, disasters of the, uh, of the 1970s. Uh, uh, moreover, that the people are friendly, uh, welcoming, and uh, believe it or not, always welcomed the other. Uh, whenever any uh, new ethnic group had come into the Bronx, uh, they felt welcome. And uh, that's been true since the 1700s onward, uh, even to today. Uh, and so we have a wide variety of people in the Bronx uh, speaking many different languages. The largest group, uh, that, the largest language group uh, today uh, is Spanish. Uh, but uh, you have uh, people from uh, every continent on the face of the earth. And uh, if you uh, consider the penguins in the Bronx Zoo, that, that includes Antarctica. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, the Bronx Zoo is actually kind of renowned throughout the world, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's the largest urban zoo in the world. And uh, it is uh, now has as, a, as its mission uh, the preservation of species that uh, so that they don't go extinct. Uh, and that's the reason why the New York uh, Zoological Society changed its name to the Wildlife Conservation Society. And they've been running the Bronx Zoo since uh, 1899, when it opened. That's when it what started, in 1899? Uh, yes, that was, the, that was the opening day in, the, uh, in, in 1899. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, most people don't know how the Bronx Zoo got started. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a fellow by the name of Madison Grant, uh, who was a member of a uh, of a, uh, a hunting club in New York City. At that time, uh, people went out west and they shot the wildlife that was out there. And he was appalled at the uh, the last time he was there that the number the amount of wildlife had decreased. And he went to the president of the, uh, uh, the that hunting club, it was called the Boone and Crockett Club, named after Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, uh, and uh, said, is there any way that uh, uh, we could start a zoo so that we can preserve these animals? And uh, the president of the club uh, took action. They had a committee to investigate. Uh, they tried Central Park. It was too crowded. And the... <laughs> And they uh, they hired a guy by the name of uh, William Hornaday uh, to be the uh, the first director of the zoo and to find a place. And he settled upon the southern part of uh, Bronx Park uh, to put it. Uh, now, the name of the guy who was the president of the Boone and Crockett Club, I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, once or twice, I think once I've come across that name. <laughs> So basically, it was uh, Madison Grant's uh, query and uh, Theodore Roosevelt's action 
uh, that created the Bronx Zoo. Do you think having, you know, what uh, one of the great presidents has uh, contributed to it remaining one of the preeminent zoos in the world? Uh, I think what it does uh, is uh, what what makes it uh, the pre one of the premier zoos of the world. Uh, William Hornaday started it all off as the uh, as the first director. And indeed, uh, in the early 20th century, he gathered together a lot of people and they met in of all places, the Lion House of the Bronx Zoo. And uh, there they established an organization to save the American buffalo, the, uh, the bison, from extinction. And uh, what they did was they gathered the, whatever buffalo they could find together into the Bronx Zoo, repropagated the herd there, siphoned them off to uh, uh, the Wichita Range in Oklahoma, and from there distributed it throughout the uh, United States. And uh, so if you go to Yellowstone National Park today and a buffalo comes over to you and speaks to you in a Bronx accent, you'll know why. <laughs> so you, uh, I've also read that you do these like walking tours of yeah. the Bronx. So where would you take people around? Uh, well, there are a lot of interesting places. Uh, uh, there's a tour I call Marvelous Mott Haven, uh, which uh, contains uh, some very, very interesting uh, places of interest in architecture, uh, including uh, a place where two of the nation's founding fathers are buried. Uh, mm. Yeah, this is uh, St. Anne's Episcopal Church on St. Anne's Avenue and 140th Street. And uh, you have Lewis Morris, who did nothing in his life but sign the Declaration of Independence. And uh, you have his half-brother, Governor Morris, who is one of the principal framers of the Constitution of the United States. In fact, uh, he was given the task of taking the scattered resolutions of the uh, Constitutional Convention and putting them into some sort of literary language so people can read this stupid thing. And uh, he... Uh, he uh, one of the tasks he did was he took a look at the preamble and its preamble as originally uh, uh, passed uh, stated, well, uh, uh, we, uh, the states of New Hampshire, uh, uh, Massachusetts Bay, uh, Rhode Island and Co Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, and all the way down geographically to Georgia. Uh, and he said, no, this is not going to do. And he changed it to we, the people which starts off the Constitution of the United States, which, of course, is a very powerful phrase uh, and has entered the American lexicon, uh, trying to identify what kind of a people we are. Um, and, uh, and so if you read the original Constitution that was passed in uh, 1787, it is written in Governor Morris's uh, style of writing. And he is called the penman of the Constitution for that, but he did a lot more than that. Uh, in the Constitutional Convention, a lot of the things that he advocated is in there, too. Why do you think he's not a household name like Thomas Jefferson or something? It's just because he never became president? I think that that's the reason why. Uh, he was well respected in his lifetime. Uh, George Washington appointed him uh, to uh, to replace Thomas Jefferson as the uh, uh, the American ambassador to France. And he was the ambassador to France at the time of the Reign of Terror and the only ambassador from any country to remain in France during the Reign of Terror. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he also later became a United States senator from New York. Uh, and uh, he did the, uh, marvelous things in his life, uh, probably the most uh, prominent Bronx site uh, there is. And there are many prominent Bronx sites. Uh, but he never became president, and uh, he, uh, you know, and he would. That's one of the reasons why uh, Thomas Jefferson is known, and Governor Morris is uh, not a household word. So, if I go to the church, like, do they display um, their uh, tombs or whatever? Like, like, is it they make it obvious that they're there? Well, Governor Morris is supposedly buried in the uh, in the churchyard, and there is a, uh, uh, a, a a large part of the churchyard that is his tomb. Uh, Lewis Morris is buried in the crypt of the church, and uh, 
That is the generally off limits, basically because the ceiling is so low, they were afraid that people would bump their heads into the ceiling and sue the church. So they... <laughs> <laughs> Always some reason why there's a rule for something, isn't there? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so where so, else do you take people to? Well, I uh, I, I take people to uh, uh, the lower part of the Grand Concourse, which has been called the Grand Concourse Historic District. It's been named that by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And uh, the Grand Concourse was an idea of an immigrant from Alsace-Lorraine, a guy by the name of Louis A. Ries, um, who modeled it after the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And it is one of the grand boulevards and a very elegant boulevard. Not only that, but in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, when hardly anybody was building any buildings, um, private developers built buildings on the Grand Concourse in what was then the prevailing Art Deco style. And consequently, the Bronx today, and specifically the uh, Grand Concourse area, has the largest collection of Art Deco residences in the world. Wow. <laughs> so why the Bronx? Why do you focus on the Bronx? Oh. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a strange story. I was always interested in history, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a toddler, I was constantly asking uh, people older than I uh, what happened before I was born. Uh, and uh, I, in education, I, may, uh, I majored in history. And uh, after I finished my graduate work, I realized I didn't know anything about the place where I was born, where I grew up, and where I still live, which was the Bronx. And I discovered there was a Bronx County Historical Society, and the Bronx County Historical Society had uh, monthly uh, lectures that were absolutely free. And I figured the price was right, so I attended one, and then I went to another and another and another. And being professionally trained, uh, I realized that the history of the Bronx was the history of the nation in microcosm. Every important event and every important movement in American history also happened in the Bronx. And therefore, you could use the Bronx as a laboratory uh, that uh, if the people who focus on national events say, oh, these are the reasons why it happened, uh, that's an interpretation. Then I take a look at the Bronx and I say, OK, was that the reason why it happened here? And if not, why not? And that really spurred me on. I got extremely interested in that. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So those of you just joining us, I'm talking with Lloyd Alton, historian, New York City, and the, specifically the Bronx, New York, author, as well as teacher. So do you still teach? Oh, yes, absolutely. I've never retired. Where do and you teach at? Uh, I teach at Fairleigh Dickinson University uh, in New Jersey. Uh, in the, uh, the Teaneck campus. Uh, they have four campuses around the world and Teaneck, New Jersey is one of them. And that's, uh, and I've been teaching there since 1964 and I've never retired. And I assume you're teaching history? Why? What else? <laughs> <laughs> you wrote some of these books. One of them, I find the title very interesting. Uh, the Bronx in the Innocent Years, from 1890 to 1925. Why do you call it the Innocent Years? Uh, well, that was the years when uh, the Bronx was really growing. Uh, starting in the 1890s, you had large numbers of, uh, of Italians and Eastern European Jews coming into the Bronx. And by the 1920s, the Bronx was the fastest growing borough in the city of New York. Uh, and uh, in those days, uh, uh, going to the Bronx was uh, was considered a step up uh, in life. Mm. Uh, and uh, the Bronx, you know, attracted people of wealth as well as uh, middle and working class people. And uh, it was a uh, uh, it, it was a time when uh, uh, we didn't have all of the complications in life that we have today. Uh, people, of course, uh, had to. Uh, to live, and they had to do things in order to get the things that they wanted, but they were able to do it, and everybody got along. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, liked each other, 
And that is the, uh, that, that's the reason why the area, the, the period uh, from the 1890s to the 1920s, I think uh, is, is the innocent years in the Bronx. Now, you stop at 25, and I find it interesting that you pick that number as opposed to, say, 29, right? Yeah. Um, what is it that you feel as though started happening from 1926 or beyond that sort of, you would say, would no longer count as the innocent years anymore? How did the Bronx start to evolve? Uh, well, again, it was, uh, it's, it's largely the, uh, the, the coming of the subway. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, the subway built the Bronx. Uh, and the uh, the last of the original subway lines of the old IRT, Interboro Rapid Transit Company, uh, finished building in uh, in 1920. And of course, you, 1925 is uh, uh, when you have a real culmination of, uh, of people moving uh, from places like the Lower East Side or East Harlem into uh, into the Bronx. And the uh, uh, developers actually uh, knew the route of the subway. Uh, they knew where a uh, subway station was going to be. And the, before the subway was actually built, they actually built apartment houses in and around the site and advertised for them. And they provided uh, a lot of amenities uh, that you couldn't find in Manhattan, such as large apartments. And in the days before air conditioning, uh, you had uh, cross ventilation. Uh, they provided uh, 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 refrigerators and stoves and uh, things like that, and brand new ones. If uh, if you're replacing uh, a tenant who had left, uh, they repainted the the uh, uh, the apartment for you. And not only that, would provide you uh, with one or two months of free rent. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> my how New York has changed. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, and of course. Uh, uh, in 1925, the uh, the population of the Bronx was approaching a million, and uh, of course, once you approach a million, you're uh, you're really on the map. So, would you say that when the subways came, referring back to this word, you know, innocence, do you think that that started to um, evolve the Bronx and indeed maybe some of the other boroughs just because of the mobility that it provided everyone from all the boroughs to start bouncing around? I mean, is that what you would attribute to the well, change? I, I think it was the, the fact that uh, you could easily, uh, within uh, 15 minutes or a half hour, depending upon how far you were away from the central part of uh, Manhattan, commute back and forth. And in those days, the fare was only a nickel five cents to travel on the subway. And uh, uh, so it was, it made life much more accessible and uh, Bronx was uh, le le less expensive than living in Manhattan and much nicer. Uh, people at the time began to say that the Bronx was like country. Uh, most people don't know that uh, today, 25% uh, of the land mass of the Bronx is parkland. Uh, that's extraordinary. And it's the largest percentage of any borough of the city of New York. You know, for a while, and I would say now in New York, anything on the, on the island is, you know, if you can get it, take it, if you can afford it, right? But there was a period of time where the Bronx, by some, would have maybe been considered not as desirable as some of the other boroughs or lower Manhattan or whatever, like what do you think attributed to that sort of uh, period of that? Uh, I, it started basically in 1977 when uh, Jimmy Carter was attending the United Nations and he, uh, he left uh, uh, at lunchtime, got into the, uh, the limousine and of course all the reporters followed him. Uh, and he got off of Charlotte Street and was walking upon block after block after block of rubble. And uh, suddenly uh, the image of the Bronx, which had been a place of upwardly mobile uh, working and middle class people, uh, suddenly shifted to the one that you find in the notorious film Fort Apache, the Bronx, uh, where uh, supposedly it was inhabited by uh, several people who were ready to pounce upon anybody who was uh, where, uh, unwary enough to pass by. 
And that changed the entire image of the Bronx. And uh, that is uh, one of the reasons why uh, people left. But also, even before then, uh, you had a shift in attitude after World War II. Uh, mm -hmm. You had, uh, uh, you know, when Johnny comes marching home, uh, there's no place to live if he got married. Uh, because there was uh, basically, except in rare places like Grand Concourse, um, no apartment building happened in the Great Depression, and certainly not during World War II. And uh, there was no place to live. But the uh, the GI Bill passed by the Congress provided uh, easy mortgages for people who would move out to the suburbs and buy a single family home. And uh, suddenly people now had money. Uh, that they had saved up during the war that they couldn't spend because of the shortages, and uh, they could buy a car. And then Robert Moses was building highways, so you could get to the subways by using your car, uh, to the suburbs by using your car. And uh, that uh, meant even all over the entire country, uh, an accent on suburban living rather than urban living as the epitome of what life should be. So not the Bronx in particular, but there was just a fundamental shift of getting out and having your own green lawn as it was. That's right. Yeah, you, uh, uh, you're sitting under your own vine and fig tree. You know, with Jimmy Carter, um, do you, you know, and of course, at that time and indeed up until basically 20 years ago or so, you know, the news cameras were all that a lot of us around America uh, would see, you know. And so yeah. do you think that Jimmy Carter going to uh, Charlotte Street, as you said, was that an unfortunate accident? Or do you think that there was something more deliberate about picking those locations? Well, I think he heard about it from, uh, you know, from people in the Bronx, uh, including uh, elected officials. Uh, people in Brownsville and Brooklyn uh, constantly said after Jimmy Carter went there and the focus was on the Bronx, uh, said, uh, you know, if he leading the United Nations, if he turned left rather than right and came to Brownsville, he would find the same conditions. And then Brownsville would be uh, uh, get all the bad publicity. But in one sense, it turned out right, because when Ed Koch became mayor of the city of New York, he was born in that area where Jimmy Carter had been. Mm. And, and he uh, he vowed that he was going to rebuild the Bronx. And he did. Uh, he started the whole thing uh, appointing Ed Logue, uh, who had uh, rebuilt central, uh, uh, central Boston uh, as the person to rebuild the Bronx. And uh, it continued uh, well on after that, so that now when you come to the Bronx, there's a lot of building going on still. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, a whole new idea of what the Bronx is like. I ran into a... Uh, uh, a person who opened up a, uh, uh, a bookstore and coffee shop, uh, a wine bar uh, okay. in, in the in the Mott Haven area. And uh, I mentioned uh, how friendly the people of the Bronx were. And she said, you know, you're right. Uh, when I first came to New York City, I was trying to find a place to live. And the only place where I felt welcome was the Bronx. Mm. So... Uh, you you begin to uh, slowly but surely have a shift in attitude of what the Bronx is like. Now, we've been talking about back in the day. What about mm -hmm. today? You know, what is what is the Bronx today? What will people see if they go there? Well, it all depends on where they go. Ah. Uh, of course, you have a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, interesting places to visit, let's say, as if you're a tourist. There were four historic houses uh, in the Bronx. Uh, there's uh, several museums, uh, and some most people don't know about. There's a recent museum that opened up on the Fordham University campus in the uh, in the uh, library. A private uh, collector uh, had donated his entire collection of uh, Roman and Greek art. Wow. And, and it is, uh, I've seen it, and of course it's smaller than the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but it is of the same quality, uh, and it's absolutely great. Uh, there's a Judaica Museum in uh, uh, in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. There is the uh, there's a museum of uh, of the maritime industry uh, on in Fort Schuyler and Throgs Neck on the uh, campus of the uh, 
the State University of New York Maritime College, which reminds me, of course, there are about 14 colleges and universities in the Bronx, and the Bronx was known as the borough of universities. Uh, but you will also find the people living. Uh, you can go up to uh, uh, Wakefield in the Bronx and you'll find a lot of uh, uh, shops that, uh, uh, that feature uh, uh, Jamaican uh, beef patties. Uh, and you could go to, uh, uh, to uh, Arthur Avenue and you could see uh, 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 lots of restaurants in, uh, in what is called the Little Italy of the Bronx. If you are interested in a, uh, uh, in a meal of uh, fish and, uh, and shellfish, uh, City Island is the place to go. It is a center of, uh, of, of that sort of thing. But also, if you want to know uh, different areas, uh, the Bronx has uh, the largest uh, uh, populations of people from Ghana uh, that uh, that live in the Bronx, and if you go there, you can see them on the street. And uh, you know, uh, and of course, there are uh, there are Mexicans and uh, Dominicans and uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, all speaking Spanish uh, in that particular areas, and there are shops that cater to their taste as well. Uh, and uh, you find the uh, uh, you know, people of, uh, you know, of, of all sorts uh, and, and uh, how they work and operate. You could come across a Greek festival over in the Pelham Bay Park area if you're there at the right time. Mm. Uh, uh, there are uh, lots of things. And if you go to uh, Riverdale, which is the wealthiest part of the Bronx, you'll find some very old mansions that are there uh, that are uh, still lived in and some are... Uh, Know, are, are, are open to the public uh, as uh, uh, as museums. Uh, it's a uh, uh, sometimes you come across uh, something that you least expect, and uh, that's what I say. Call it the wonder of the Bronx. Okay, so we just have a minute or so left. You still teach at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. Do uh, or do, are your classes? online like can people take your courses even if uh they're not local well no unfortunately they cannot uh the university uh, you know tried uh, zoom classes uh at the height of the pandemic and nobody liked it uh, they they said it's, it's it's no good neither the teachers nor the students and so uh the uh, uh they provide very very few uh instances of uh of uh, classes that you could take by zoom Okay, uh, so for those of us who are the history buffs, how can we learn more about what it is that you're offering here as a historian? Where can people find you? Where can we see your work? Well, uh, you can go to the Bronx County Historical Society. Uh, that's at, uh, uh, if you want to get them online, it's uh, bronxhistoricalsociety.org. And uh, you could access them uh, and you'll find uh, they have uh, uh, most of my books are on sale uh, from them. And also, uh, uh, if you want to go beyond me, uh, they have a library and a uh, and two museums uh, that you could uh, that you could go to. And they also provide uh, tours. Um, uh, that's uh, that I think is the best place that that, that you could go to find information. You know, you're also uh, burying the lead. There is one other place, which is just simply LloydAlton.com. No, no, unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, I am not uh, personally online, uh, but I am not. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, inaccessible. Um, I'm yeah. looking at it right now. I see a whole page about you with your picture and everything in your history. It's a wonderful background of who you are and what you've done. It has been an amazing career that you are still having there's really okay. something to be said for uh living it instead of just working right absolutely any final thoughts to our audience today well i would say that uh you know change your mindset and come to the bronx see what's there and enjoy uh it's uh it's something that is a complete revelation and uh you you should try it at least once in your life and come again and again and again anyway even if you're just seeing a Yankee game at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> Mr. Alton, it was a real pleasure and privilege to talk to you today. To everybody else, I hope you've enjoyed this just as much as I did. I'm Ross Morasso. Until next time. 
Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.